Well, welcome back to part two. And here we are at the Sportfish Centre and this is Haywood's Farm right here. Um, this is such a different water than the one that we've actually been fishing at Diva. Uh, it's bigger. We're going to do a lot of different styles, but centering more on the fact that the water has come up, the fish might be hunting the margins, they may be feeding on midges. So we're going to we're going to first we're going to look at the tactics that might explore that area but what a wonderful place to be on a serious note i've got some tippet rings and i've managed to get one of them into the jaws of my forceps there and i'm making a three turn or a four turn blood knot you can use a grin or you can use anything you like really as long as it's going to secure that into place but this is where this bit's really important because moistens so it snugs really down and beautifully. So why use a tippet ring anyway? Well, nylon or monofilaments and fluorocarbon hate one another. And we like to use fluorocarbon. Why? Because the fish find it slightly less detectable. I'm sure they can see it, but it's less detectable. So by having that little tiny ring there allows you to have the ability to maintain the braking strain. And that's the important thing. It's all, all we're doing is maintaining the braking strain. And by having it going through, n not something that's discordant, but a, 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 a rather... I suppose good chord sequence as opposed to discord sequence. Same thing there. Now once I've got past that, I can go into the usual format of, of creating my leader because I want several flies on this. Okay. So chest end of, but I tend to go a bit more and then trim that out and I'll show you a really neat little trick now to double up the time so I'm going to double up that amount so that was over there so we're doubling doubling that whole section up I was shown this by the wonderful Stan Mankoff who's one of the best anglers I know so again, find that middle bit, bring this section up and just put your thumb through there. So now I've got a double section at the bottom. There. Moisten, bring together, pull that loop, and it is a loop, really long loop through, three times. Pull. Trim that top section. Comme ça. Run your hand down here. Doesn't matter which one at this point, actually. Measure the length of the dropper. Here's your dropper. That's, I think that's rather cool because it does make life a lot simpler. So, there's our dropper, and I'm going to put a dropper in up here as well. Why not? Now, I watched Howard Croston, and I think we all did last year, and poor Howard losing that fly line is going to be forever indelibly etched into our mind. But um, what intrigued me was, A, he was using a shooting head, but the more, I think, I think the observant, of us noticed that he had some weighted buzzers in the middle of his leader setup and what they were doing was of course rising and falling up and down through the layers and as we did in the stalking feature trying to get depth is crucial and what I didn't say when we were doing the stalking feature is I found it absolutely vital to 
get my fly in front of a fish, so I needed a weighted pattern enough to get it there quickly, but they wouldn't take on the drop. They simply wouldn't have it on the drop today. But what they did want is it sitting, coming down the bottom and tweaked off the bottom, and then they would, then they would look. So depth in our game is absolutely crucial. We said it time and again, but it's worth re-emphasizing. Now, the other lovely thing about this game is, now I've got three, I've got two droppers and a point fly. Fulling mill, those lovely providers of exotic things, oops, to go on the end of our tippet, have provided us with a whole cornucopia of delights. We've got black nymphs, we've got dialbacks, we've got strange jiggy-like things. We've got things, frankly, that you might want to use and actually, I don't, but they're there. But so we're going to go for the time-honored thing of, of some really nice little orange blobs here, little subtle, subtle things, which are, are delightful actually. But we're going to go for an attractor and a, quite a big chunk of foam for the point here and just do the classic washing line. That'll be our main system, which we can change. You know, we're not averse to changing anything here. And I'll explain the leader and everything else attached to it. Now, Jonathan has been telling me that he's seen rising fish, they're on damsels and so forth, but we want to do, we want to have a bit of relaxing fishing. So all I want to do right now is to get out there, cast out and twiddle back, as we say, and just gently have an afternoon sport. Now, there's an awful lot of things here. What have we got in here? We've got a crunches, we've got all sorts of things. We've got this rather nice sort of Nemo-like cruncher. Um, we've got, these, there's some great patterns here actually. Um, that might come in handy later on, that's the olive snake. Um, these feel quite heavy um, and we know that there's some really cunning buzzery things in there but the thing that really caught my eye is just this simple black nymph. There's nothing, it's, it's a cruncher, but it's called a black cruncher. Um, in a, that wonderful original sort of way of naming flies that's black. This is a black cruncher right there. But actually it does look rather good. It's got tails and all sorts. It's got a lot of stuff going on. So I'm going to be putting that up near the source of my floating line. So that's going on the top and I want a heavy, heavy design right in the middle. So that's going on. Now, of course, the big, <laughs> the big thing here is if you lose one fly, you tend to lose the whole lot. So. That is the downside of using three flies, but bear with, it's worth it. Because I think people are still under the misconception that you put three flies on with the express aim of catching three fish, you don't. Um, you're actually getting one to fish with the other that enhances the other and so on and so forth. Now, where do we put those buzzers? Is this the one? This is the packet. These I like a lot. So there's little wormsy things and even Dyson got excited by this. Look, look, look at that. Look, look. It's one of Howard's worms right there. I have to say that in polite company. Um, but there's green ones. I'm gonna go for this quite heavy one, this, this big guy here. You got really quite excited there, didn't you? 
So what do you think? You reckon this is going to work? This is a barbless pattern. It's fascinating in as much that it's got a little blob on the top. There's a lot going on on this pattern. It's got little orange cheeks. There we go. Now I'm not going to worry about a waistcoat. I'm going to make this my, my, my base, if you like. Um, I've got everything I need, but I will put that up on top. But just before we go out there, this is what we used to use. Jonathan, I showed you these. They're a ray from the grave. We've got um, grenadiers, we've got red tag wickhams, we've got stick flies, we've got blackdown buzzers, cinnamon and gold, silver invictus. Tied actually by a dear old friend of mine called Glyn Hopper. And um, I'm just wondering if they'd still work today. I don't know. I think they probably would. There's some fascinating things there, but not for today, I don't think. So anyway, pretty much ready. Off we go. Now the rod I'm using for this, this little bit of madness is a six weight. It's a 10 foot six weight, which is a great deal bigger and longer than we used earlier. And the reason I want this is I just get a little bit of lift. I get a bit of area going up. And I found that you, it gives you a slightly different tactical advantage. And I don't know why that should be. It's just, I tend to fish differently when I've got a 10 foot rod than I do have a nine foot. Now there is a downside to this. A nine, a nine foot rod will always tend to follow your hand direction and stop where you want it to do. The 10 foot rod, there is a marked difference with the tip just kicking back and there is an element that sometimes people drop on their back cast. So do watch that when you're using, you shifted the emphasis from shorter rod to the longer one. Might be a good idea. Robin is with a client up there. It might be a good idea just to have a quick lesson or two, just to get yourself familiarized. If you're a tennis player, you would do it. Um, if you were a golf player, you'd do it. Why we don't do it as fly fishers, I've no idea. I'm gonna get cracking. saying earlier what I've had to do because I've got a really heavy fly in the middle and I want to get that turnover I'm having to slow my casting stroke right down and that means I always have a little look so I mean I don't know why I'm looking behind because that's where I want it to go but oh had a little pull then how nice oh and another little pull maybe perch I don't know um, but um, Slowing that casting stroke down has really made a big difference because the one thing you want with this game is turnover, is to get that whole chain of flies to go out and turn over and happy days. Jonathan, we've got a fish. What a lovely thing it is to start and get a fish, eh? I mean, I don't even care what size it is. The fact that it's a cracking rainbow on a blob, I don't care. Life is good. And after the purgatory of this morning, this is a bright, shimmering, absolute sleek Haywards Farm rainbow. Suddenly I'm in love with the place. I don't want to fish anywhere else. Um, and I'd like to say it's good night from me. <laughs> Jonathan's got, uh, Jonathan, who's behind the camera here at the point, has got a smile on his face about as bright and as broad as the day. So, this is where I need to train my Labrador to fetch my net. He's used it. Dyson, net. Net. No, obviously that's not working. But gosh, what fun. And I, I've got to be honest, this is on a style of fishing I'd much rather do perhaps than any other. Just cross the wind, 
keeping in touch with everything, just barely, barely moving it, letting the wind do a lot more of the work. And it's just wonderful. I feel very happy. On a floating line, really quite a long leader. It's about 20 odd feet of leader here. tapered to begin with and then down to that straight section that I showed you. I never rushed this bit. Why? Because I actually enjoy it. Seeing that fish, ah, oh, just sheer heaven. And the clarity of this water and the coldness, they're absolutely at their peak. And if dad lets those young people come down here, they can see a trout. There we go. Do you want to come and have a look? Do you want to come and have a look at the fish? Hello girls. Hello. How are you? Good. Now this is a rainbow trout. <gasps> Isn't it pretty? I've seen one before. Oh you have? Mm -hmm. Oh I've you caught one. Oh really? And um, isn't it, isn't it gorgeous? Yeah, it's now what you must do, if we're gonna put this back, is we're gonna wet the hands. And then just slide a hand down here. Hopefully this is barbarous, but I'll soon find out. I don't know if it is, actually. Can it bite? It can, actually. It really can. It's got some very, very sharp teeth indeed. I and mean, that wasn't going anywhere. Little tweak there. Now, I'm just going to hold it in the water. You never take them out because the reason I don't take fish out of the water is because if you suddenly lift them up, all their tummy goes straight down to the bottom so that they don't feel very nice. I mean, it's a bit like someone picking you up on your side and suddenly lifting you up. You wouldn't like it very much, would you? It's like if you're playing the water for three Yeah. So now I'm just going to ease them out or her or it or whatever it is and keep it. Now, fish nice and wet and it just kicks off and you watch it go off and you go, yes. So you're going to go over there and do, do that? We are. Brilliant. Well, I shall have to come over and see how you get on. We're just going to do so try and catch one for the girls in the little pond. Brilliant. Okay. Nice to Lovely see to see you both. Or oh, all three of you. <laughs> sometimes like to do especially as I know that we've got a heavy middle fly and a buoyant fly on the point is just to do that which will get everything to suddenly rise up and then drop down not to a huge degree but to a little degree if you ever really want to know about nymph fishing probably in the old school but it's well worth a read even today and that is um, the, the book by Arthur Cove on nymph fishing. I think it's called Arthur Cove My Way or something like that. Some Sinatra connotation. But um, it's still sound advice. And what Arthur, I don't think he mentioned it in that book. He used to keep a cracked old fly line expressly for fishing just underneath the surface because it absorbed a bit of water not hugely but it absorbed enough and isn't it strange that we've just invented fly lines oh look there you go now always pay attention and always make sure that you fish out a retrieve sometimes you are on your game and today thank goodness it's come good this afternoon and this is a oh it's off having said that but i don't mind i mean i hooked that fish and you know brilliant i was going to put it back anyway what what a great bit of fun that was can i go again enjoying this And again, on that bright shard of colour, the blob. 
getting that line speed up to get that turnover is important. So out oh, that's gone. So yeah, that crack ply line, it just sat underneath the surface, just sort of bobbled around. And we, we would call it a, I don't know, hover line now. But um, yeah, what oh, that, that was so much fun. See that fish come up, boom. But the one thing I, I can honestly say, you know, is that many people will tell you, you know, <laughs> Oh, he turned 70 this year, you know. Well, he did. And I still, as much in love with my sport now, as I always was. And it's that lovely thing of a thing, it's a gift that really does keep giving. Even in your worst days, it's still there as a delicious memory you know, perhaps not to do the same thing again, but it gives you and fuels memory. You know, and I'm just watching at clusters of, of, I don't know what they are, they look like, almost look like golden plover going across there. Um, there are, I know there's coots out there, and it, you know it's this whole coming together, there's the light on the water. And if you want to know about light on water, go and have a look at a Peter Scott painting back in the 50s. He captured that magnificently. And it's all of that. It's all of that. And fishing. Just going to check that. Oh, look at that. Interesting. Oh! Now that's even more interesting. That fly's just been bitten off. Look at that clean bite off. Do you think pike like Croston buzzers with tungsten? Or is it a ferocious perch? Don't know. I think I'd better put another fly on. It's probably that moment to look at camera and say, I'm getting quite cold for an old person. <laughs> and we've caught some fish. We've using a method that is absolutely delightful to use is very effective um, just holding that fly up in the surface allowing the other to belly down and then pulling it up it's just exactly what the naturals would do um, and you're, you're fishing in layers that ordinarily they wouldn't be hit so i think there are so many pluses that it's well well worth you trying so and the nice thing is that nowadays you can get flies like you have with Fulling Mill that allow you to do this that were once in the secret list. So there is no excuse because they're out there to purchase and you don't have to tie them. They're as good as anyone could possibly tie them. So there's no excuse. So now we can choose the flies that suit the way we want to fish, whereas before we had to tie them. So with that good leader material um, and a wonderful day and some cold water, I'm going to say cheerio, um, have a wonderful spring festival here at Seal and the Sportfish Centre here, but have an even better season. So that's it from me. Cheerio. Cheerio.